Good morning. That was a, I heard one person. Good morning. <laughs> there we go. I'm Chrissy Kim, the president of your board of trustees. Welcome to you, old friends and new, young and seasoned. You are an essential part of our celebration today. Whether today is your first or your thousandth Sunday in our midst, we are stronger because you are here. Whether you join us in person or online, we're glad you're with us. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, sexualities, and genders. We are all growing, all learning, all loved. Just as you are, you are welcome here. As we do each week and as we begin our gathering, I respectfully acknowledge that I speak to you today from occupied Puyallup and Coast Salish ancestral lands. I pay respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to their descendants and all indigenous peoples. We are joining you again today in multi-platform mode. You will see some of us here in the sanctuary and others joining us from online in Zoom. For those meeting in person today, we invite you to join us for coffee time following the service. Red mugs are available for visitors who would like to chat. Also for those in person, this facility is equipped with a hearing assistance system. Devices are available at the table in the back of the sanctuary. We continue to welcome our children back for our religious exploration program. Registration forms are available on our website as well as on Sunday mornings. We are in the midst of a transition and we need your help to make this a smooth ride. As RE continues to grow, we need volunteers to support it, including some teachers for RE in the coming months. Please see me or email board at tahomauu.com to sign up to volunteer to help. To keep our worship going strong over the summer, as we prepare for our contract minister, we also need some online hosts and celebrants, as well as people willing to serve on the worship committee. If you regularly attend worship online, consider volunteering to be a host who welcomes people as they enter and who helps support our online worshipers. Orientation and guidance will be provided. We'll need a few more people to serve as celebrants as well. Help support the speakers and ministers who will be providing us with worship until our contract minister is in place and to assist with worship as we go into the fall. Training support and loud cheers are freely and happily given to all who step forward to assist. We are in our annual pledge drive. Our goal is to raise $152,211. So far, two weeks into our four week drive, we are, thank you, <laughs> we are at 20%. And we are counting on you to help us reach our goal. Our proposed budget includes only enough funding to support a half time minister. This new minister will support and guide us as we move forward reconnecting within our community and providing support to our larger community while our religious exploration program takes off once again. It will take all of us, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Pledge sheets are available at the table in the hallway and also online on our website. Our annual congregational meeting will be held Sunday, June 11th at approximately noon. All members in good standing will be able to vote at the meeting and are encouraged to attend. The third Friday potluck is this week at 1130. The speaker is John Pettit from the Tacoma Astronomical Society who will be talking about solar telescopes and will also have some available to use and you'll be able to look directly at the sun. Hope you can join us there. As always, details for our upcoming services can be found on our website or in the e-news. And um, just to note that our new um, admin, Sharon, is preferring that e-news updates be sent to her directly at the admin website instead of that e-news. So I'm hearing that some folks have sent updates to the, the e-news um, at Gmail email and they're not making it into the e-news. So if you send them to her at the admin, they will get into the e-news. As always, oh, sorry, that's, I already read that. The next, next week, our service will be Sermons I Didn't Give with Reverend Linda. What's been left unsaid after all this time? Come next week to find out.
Good morning. Wasn't that splendid? We are so lucky. We are so lucky. Our regular pianist, Mary Ann, is um, on uh, break for last week and this week. And so we're blessed to have music from Doug um, today and also from Melissa Dusselet, who will be accompanying our hymns um, on Hammered Dulcimer. So get yourselves ready for a, for a true, honest treat today. Not that every week isn't a true honest treat, just that some true honest treats are more true honest treats than others. Our opening words for today come from Wayne Arneson. We are here from far and wide, we are here. From down the street and across town, we are here. From last Sunday and 50 years past, we are here. From tomorrow, always from tomorrow, we are here with thanksgiving and with joy. We are here to celebrate this community and all it has been and all it will become. We are here and it is very good to be together. I'd like to invite Patty to come up to light our chalice today. And will you all please join me in saying our chalice lighting words. We light this chalice in deep respect for the mystery and holiness of life, in honor and gratitude for those who have gone before, with love and compassion for those who dwell among us, and with hope and faith for the generations to come. 
And now let us join in singing. I, I want to note um, that um, part of the way we, I selected hymns this week was knowing which hymns the tunes Melissa already knew. Yeah, you can come on up, honey. Um, the tunes that she already knew. And when I saw this one um, matched, one of the tunes that she knew, I thought, wonderful. And somewhat later, I um, looked a little more carefully at the words. And it may be a little more uh, Genesis 1 than um, I had expected it to be. But let's sing along with an appreciation of all the various um, creation stories that celebrate the earth. Let us join in singing. Yeah, we're, we're actually going to do 207, which is a tune you know. You may not know this song, but you do know the tune. So turn to 207. It's, no, yeah, that helps if Ashley. That one. Actually, this one, we're, I'm going to have her play it through so you will recognize this tune. If you feel like getting up and singing this with me, please do. I love the energy. So all the way through first? All the way through. Yeah. 
I would hope to invite the children to come forward. Anyone who might want to be here with them is welcome to come up as well. I have the most spectacular story for you guys today. I love this story. This is like so completely cool of a story. Do any of you like tell, telling stories? Yeah, do you like telling stories? Eh, maybe, maybe a little, maybe yes, maybe no. I'm gonna tell a story about how difficult this clip is <laughs> to get on right now. And do you know how difficult it is? Do you wanna guess how difficult it is? Very. I would love help. So it just needs, I just need to get it so it's close to my mouth. Bless you. Awesome, awesome, yay for Chris, woo, to the rescue. You know, I, let me just note, this is one of the things we do here is we help each other. And I really appreciate the fact that we help each other because we help each other a lot. So this is called a squiggly story. And off they go. And that's our story for today. I think you all might want to have this book downstairs. Is somebody yes. willing to carry it down? Would you like to carry it down, Charles? Can I carry it? Um, um, I already gave it to Charles, so maybe if we take the book down next week, you can take it. Okay, good. All right, let's sing our children now. Let's stand, make an arch, and sing. Oops. As you go, as you go, may your hearts be at peace as you go to nurture the spark of your precious love. We hold you in our love as you go. We now come to the part of our service with our operatory. I have words this morning from Erica Hewitt. The offering that we take each Sunday is not just a stale habit. It is an opportunity to recommit to this place to these people. Our offering is an affirmation, a yes. What we give, we say yes to, saying yes to something we value. With our gifts freely given, may we say yes to the values of our faith. May our offering help us practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation as tools to empower our, our mission. As we are in part of our pledge drive right now, think about the value that TUUC brings to you, those around you, to the community. This is your opportunity to help TUUC continue to be strong in these challenging times. Please look into your heart and give freely to help support the church that we love so much. You can do it online as well as in person. And during this period of time, you can set a goal for, for what you're going to give to the church over this next period. Patty and I have already done so and looked into our hearts and raised our commitment again this year. Because this area, this church, is so important to not only Patty and I, but the, to commu the community that we're part of and the greater community that TUUC serves. Thank you.
We pause now for some time for quiet and reflection together. And on this uh, Mother's Day, I want to acknowledge that for some of us, it's a great celebration. Being mothers ourselves, loving our mothers. And for some of us, it's a harder day for all kinds of reasons, more than we can count, more than we know. So however you come to the celebration today, I invite you to just pause now and breathe and listen to these words. Where have we come? from this breath, these fingers, a heart that opens and closes, opens and closes. What is it that has made this body, feet and legs, hair and teeth? We come into consciousness in the middle of the story the world and its vast life reaches before us and grasps at the future that we cannot know. And here we are, born into this world and living these days for better or for worse. Whatever acts of chance occurred to bring us to birth, whatever happenstance laid this particular path for our lives, in these moments of calm and stillness, let our hearts open in gratitude for all the gifts that can be found along the way. For love given sweet and free, for the peace of the morning and the warm colors of sunset, for the grace of companions and for moments of ongoing birth as our hearts are renewed. And for those of us who have offered the gift of mothering, no matter their age or gender, for those who have tended and cared, who have offered support and comfort, for those who have stood by us and stood with us, those who have given us life by birth or by their presence in our lives. Let us lift up our hearts in gratitude this morning. Here in the sanctuary, I invite you as you are moved to say aloud the names of those who have given you life, however that has come to you. And for those of you online, if you want to share in the chat, please do. Let us enter into a time of stillness. So may it be. Amen. The opening reading today is from John Cummins from his introduction to this strange and wondrous journey, a collection of his sermons. What I would like to say to the people of the future is this. 
You will look back on us with astonishment at the truths that stared us in the face and which we did not see. You will look with wonder at the bright toys which we created and used only for the rape of the planet and one another. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just going to make but, sure people can see. But know this also, you of the future, you with the, your libraries and fountains, you in your star cities, know that even in your our slumbers we dreamed. In our fumbling, shadowed search for mistaken glories, even in our clumsy cruelties, it was for you we dreamed. Beneath the piled up centuries below the lost and ruined rubble of our striving, it was you who lay safe and folded in the womb of our dreaming. You, the first cause of all our daring, even now in the comforts, it comforts me to know that it shall one day be as the way showers have for centuries foretold. In that far age and in the chrysalis of time, it shall be your glory and a cause of pride that born into a universe without justice or mercy. Our kind bethought itself of justice and mercy and put them there. Remember us for this, that in our wildest wanderings, Never did we forsake the dream. It was a dream almost 80 years ago. On April 12th, 1944, it was a Wednesday. 44 people gathered somewhere in Tacoma to sign papers and create what would later become Tahoma Unitarian Universalist Congregation. It was a bold move on their part, I have to say. This was towards the end of the Second World War. Europe was burning. There was a fierce battle going on in the Pacific and nothing, nothing was certain. In April of that year, D-Day was still a complete secret. No one knew what was coming. It would be two months before that began to signal the end of the war. SeaTac had just opened after two years of construction. Tacoma with Fort Lewis nearby and the shipyard that we had um, was that was good for pumping out ships for the war effort. Um, this whole area ballooned in population and jobs. Secretary of State Bell Reeves, yes, a woman in 1944, um, she had actually won election in 40 and 44. How, how surprising is that? Were we like ahead of the, of the I mean, seriously, y'all, ahead of things. She said, no state has been more profoundly affected by the economic, economically by the expansion of war industries than Washington. By the middle of 1941, migration of war workers was already at full tide and the relation of prime military contracts in the Puget Sound area to the value of manufacturing products in 1939 was relatively five times greater than for the country as a whole. The relationship of war work to normal activity has been about twice as great as for Los Angeles and four times greater than San Francisco, all here in our own little Tacoma. 33,000 men and women worked in Tacoma to build five freighters, to transports, 37 escort carriers, five gasoline tankers, and three destroying te destroyer tenders. It was a time, my friends. Rationing was still going on, and there was so much uncertainty about the future, and yet 44 people, I assume, 
a collection of men and women, gathered to say something about the future that they wanted to live into. They created this organization that would endure for almost 80 years, 80 years next year, and counting. I don't know about you, I have never created anything that I en expect will endure for that length of time. Um, I, um, I haven't, um, you, you know, like who does this, right? Who creates like that? We can be grateful for those predecessors of ours. This isn't a story we talk about in here all that often. Um, I dug up a whole bunch of facts uh, back in for our 75th anniversary in 2019 and was surprised by what I learned. You see, the roots of this place are deep into this city, this place on the water. The roots of this place have held it through times of struggle and infighting through the wilderness that was Unitarian Universalism in the 1970s and the 1960s, the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing kind of was a little big in Unitarian Universalism of those days. Um, for those of you who weren't around, Chris, are you chuckling back there? <laughs> Chris Kaufman, who is in the back, was, uh, was part of that community during that time. And into this day, our roots are still here and sustaining us as we continue to recover from the pandemic and create and sustain community. You know, I've, I've had the pleasure of listening to some of our long-term members reminisce about this congregation, about the early days. There have been some amazing, amazing moments. The hearty little gang that got together and raised money to buy a piece of property and hire architects to create an architecturally significant building on Bant Street. They came together there for worship and for world culture dinners, all kinds of things. They danced together, had study groups, they had book groups. And then, when State Road 16 was built in 1964, the state took eminent domain over the property, gave the congregation a hefty payout, and took it down. I, these, um, if you don't know, our um, mosaics up here came from that building, right, Chris? They were a part of that building. So um, we carry the Bant Street property here um, in our small way. We bought this building outright, and we have been here since, though have tried periodically to not be here, to find somewhere else that we could be. And we kept on with our vibrant community life. There have been times of tension, difficulty, out and out conflict. Sometimes that's happened with ministers and sometimes it's happened without, but somehow, somehow we have endured um, through uh, the crazy drunken 70s, through the sexual revolution, civil rights, through feminism and Stonewall, and we are still here. That place and this, that Bant Street place and this has been witnessed to babies blessed in love. It has been witnessed to people in grief, those who come together to celebrate the life of a beloved. There has been dancing and delight in here. And of course, those hard times when there was conflict, loss, tension, and trouble. But I have to say, I have to say that what has impressed me most about this congregation over the nearly nine years that I have been minister here is its absolute and utter persistence. Through difficult times, people have stayed and things have continued on. I think it says something about the quality of love that is at the heart of this gathering in this place, the quality of love that those people almost 80 years ago sought to embody in a community. 
here in Tacoma. Through, P through um, so, um, yes. So just before I arrived here, a very beloved member of this congregation died. And I had the honor of conducting his memorial service. Now the story around Bruce Rowan is very complicated and I'm not gonna tell very much about it because the details, um, the details are, um, are not something to share in a, with a group of people whose histories I don't know. It could be very triggering. Um, it could be um, just really distressing and disturbing. So I'm not gonna talk about details, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit um, about that time, because I think it's a it's it's one of the important stories of this congregation. I know only some of you in this room remember Bruce. Um, I never met him, but only heard about his love for this congregation and his very vital contributions. He was always there to help, I heard. Usually in the background, not saying anything about it, just taking care of what needed um, to happen to make an event work or to connect with the elders that he called every week. He initiated and supported a salmon bake that happened for several years on the first Sunday after Labor Day because it was important to gather people in community and love and celebration. But Bruce came to this congregation after he had spent an extended time at Western State Hospital. The details of the incident, the crime that put him there are really, as I said, too painful to share. So suffice to say, it was um, a cause uh, for concern for many of the members of the congregation at the time. And after a very difficult period of discernment, and then the creation of an agreement that limited his participation and required that he have a companion, a designated companion who was with him um, all the time when he was here in the building, he became a member. And I have to tell you, that's a stunning act of courage and compassion that happened for this congregation to welcome him and then to come to love him and not just kind of think he's a nice fellow, but to truly, I think, and deeply love him for the gifts that he brought in spite of what he had done in his life. This room was full for his memorial service. You know, to welcome the stranger, to welcome someone who had struggled so hard in his life and who had done unthinkable things for most of us, and all of the truth of who he was, was out there for people to know. To do that was an act of courage and love, of acceptance and living out some of our most cherished values. When we acknowledge the worth and dignity of everyone, everyone, no one excluded, as our first principle states, I know it's easier to do that, to celebrate and affirm that in, in theory, but in particular, it can be much, much harder. This congregation lived what it believed at that time. It is a story not often told, but one that lives in our DNA in this community, and it's important to recognize that that's a big part of who we are. The second story that I wanna tell um, is about, uh, comes from this time of pandemic and the decision that we made to become a site for safe parking. Now, in those days uh, of isolation, those early days, gosh, do you remember how miserable that was, how frightened we all were? Our church property wound up um, being an ongoing site of overnight campers. This has been a problem here for years, um, but it increased at that point and drug deals and there was trash dumping. I mean, it was, it was awful. 
It was awful in those first days. We struggled to figure out ways to protect our mostly, almost entirely unused building during that time. The board talked about putting up fencing or creating architectural barriers to keep people off the property. But some folks, some folks said, no, we are not going to close ourselves off. They refused to let us do that. Once discovering, as they were, as we were still trying to figure that out, it was possible to become a site for a pilot program to welcome unhoused people who were sleeping in their cars into our parking lot, a small group of people, a small group of dedicated, compassionate, fierce people <laughs> came together to make it happen. They gathered information, created a proposal, built a volunteer team, held online informational meetings for the congregation and for the community and did doorbelling and all kinds of things. Um, to let folks know what was going on and what we were trying to accomplish. And then they asked the congregation to support it. We weren't going to do this unless our congregation agreed to do it. It was too big a step. And we overwhelmingly did. We said yes. And it has been a wonderful success. I meet most Wednesdays with the team that coordinates it. And um, I have to tell you the stories of people who we are helping, have helped, will help, um, are, are um, I don't even have language to describe how much it moves me each time we gather. You need to know and you need to remember that we, you, have built and supported a safe space for people who are need in the midst of a wildly difficult and disorienting time. During the pandemic, we started this process. I mean, who does that? Who does that? And now we continue to offer hospitality and care to our neighbors and companions in the wider community who are still in need. The program did indeed keep our building safer than it had been. And the volunteers bless all of their cotton socks, to use a British phrase. The volunteers come by every day to monitor the property and to tidy up the porta potty again, bless their cotton socks and, um, you know, handy wipes that uh, uh, allow them to do that. They ensure all is well here. This is what we're capable of doing in the world when we focus our hearts and minds on what's possible and what's needed. A few weeks ago when I spoke about our religious explorations program beginning again, I quoted Annie Lamott, Anne Lamott, I always want to call her Annie, um, when she wrote about her son Sam, who did not want to go to church, um, she said the main reason I make Sam go to church is that I want to give him what I found in the world, which is to say a path and a little light to see by. That's us, friends. That's you pointing to that path and shining a light. That's your story. My mentor and late colleague, Bob Carnan, spoke to what makes that possible for us, for you to do that. He wrote, our churches and fellowships exist to speak to some, for something and to something. A great more compelling, a great deal, oof, a great deal more compelling and significant and powerful than size or building or money. They exist and have for these long years to bring us together in kindness and honesty and to give us the gift of our deep and good friendships. They also invite us if we need the invitation to listen to the cries of injustice and of pain and to do something curative about them. They invite us to share our woes, our tears, our laughter, our joy, they ask us to share our lost moments and our insanity, as well as our found ones 
and our sanity. For each of us has all of these things at one time or another. They request our honest presence so that we may share in the honesty, the goodness that honesty brings. It is not capital T truth that we, they seek, but the truths of the mind and heart as we seek and find and lose and find them together. We need each other for all of the reasons, all of the ways and for all of the reasons that Bob suggests. Friendship, work for justice, honest kindness, um, and the possibility and promise of making a difference in the world. We need each other for celebration and for mourning. All of it is still needed and perhaps even more as we discern what we can do, what I, we can, um, what we can in our joining together and can uh, bring about what we can bring into the world, what light we can create and looking for that path that we can take. The last thing I'll say about this congregation is that it's a scrappy fighter for existence, right? There have been times of really serious, significant, deep conflict in, uh, at, and at times its continued existence has come into questions, question, and at times there have been lesser stresses and difficulties as these last few years have been. But what I know about this congregation, one of the many things I know, is that you will continue on this journey of creating the future as you figure out what that next chapter of your life and your story is going to be together. As it was back in April of 1944, it is now. The way is better when we go together, when we come to one another with love and compassion, when we seek the truth with clear eyes, when we share the abundance that is ours to share with those who need it. We all know that the future holds mysteries and delights and troubles beyond our imagining. But with hope and faith in the future and trust in each other and in possibility, with a commitment to do what must be done, knowing that love manifests itself in justice, that love manifests itself in peace, and that love manifests itself in healing our tired earth, that love manifests itself in us and around us and between us always. Let us go forward into the future with love always. May it be so tomorrow and tomorrow, world without end. Amen. I invite you to take a moment or two to pause in stillness. If there's been something today in the service that has touched you, I invite you to set an intention for how you will carry it out into the world. So may it be. Amen. Let's join in singing again. Our closing hymn is number 16, Simple Gifts. And Melissa will play it through one time before we start singing. Come on, stand up with me. If you're able to do that, please. This is a fun song. Reminds me of an Irish jig. And I'm going to suggest that we sing it twice. It's a very short song. 
And thanks to Patty for being our song leader today. Our closing from Gary Kowalski. And now may the blessings of life be upon us and upon this congregation. May the memories we gather here give us hope for the future. May the love that we share bring strength and joy to our hearts. And the peace of this community be with us until we meet again. So may it be, amen, and blessed be. Let's say together our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now I invite us all to rise in body or spirit and to join in singing our closing blessing song. Uh, oh, I will. <laughs> oh, Patty, at the from you, let me see. To you, give together, we share, and by this we live from you, I see.